Okay, Nitaniku Enkki. Hello, my name is Singer. In Blackfoot, my name means Singer. But my Christian name, or my government name, is Grant Many Heads, and I'm one of the interpreters here at Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park. And today we're going to be talking about Blackfoot history, in particular firewater, our alcohol, and the history with the Blackfoot people, six of gates at the peaks. So we're going to go back to about 1670 and talk a little bit about the trade and how alcohol was actually introduced to our people. And today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the effects at that time of alcohol on the Blackfoot people when it came to trade. Uh, so we'll get into that. But in the meantime, to start, uh, I figure, well, let's find out who the six of gates eat the beaks are. So if you see the image there, you could see where it says six of gates eat the bee. And below, I guess that's just a rough translation, the Blackfoot Confederacy. While six of gates eat the bee basically means Blackfoot speaking peoples. And if you see those uh, in the diagram there, you can see the four different tribes that make up the Blackfoot speaking peoples. So you can see uh, Siksika and just below them, and actually I'm from Siksika, uh, so this is our tribe. And then below us is our sister tribe, the Agena, or the many chiefs, the Bloods, as they're uh, known as. And then on the other side there, you see Amskapi Pikani. Well, these are the Blackfoot Indians who live in the United States of America. And they're across the line. That's why we say Amskapi. And then if you look at the top, the Pikani. And those are the ones that live here in Canada, up near uh, Pincher Creek and up near uh, Brockett. So these four tribes together make up the Blackfoot speaking peoples, the six gates eat the peaks. So if we look at the next image, this is who the history is about. So Niitawasi, uh, this is our name in Blackfoot for our land. So all of our territory is Niitawasi to us. So Niitawasi Nani basically means we are the people of the land of the buffalo. The land that we live on belongs to the buffalo, but we were the people that hunted the buffalo and followed it all over our lands. So this is Nittawasinani. So our ancient stories, they tell us that uh, we were given this territory by Itzabeta Biopa. And in our language, the Blackfoot language, that means like the creator or the essence of life. Uh, and we use another term, Apistadoki, meaning creator. So these two terms apply to the, the great spirit that the Blackfoot people worship. So, if we look at Nitawas in our territory, if you look at the map, it was pretty extensive. So, it extended from the Bonokasi Sata, or the North Saskatchewan River, you can see up top there where Edmonton is, and then you travel along to Prince Albert. Well, this is the North Saskatchewan River, and that was the, the northern uh, part of the prairies, the plains. So, this is uh, when you go north of this river, you kind of go into bushland and you kind of go into the woodlands. And there's less buffalo up there, but that's not to say there, there weren't buffalo. There were buffalo up in that area. But the Blackfoot hunted the buffalo that were south of the North Saskatchewan River. And so from the North Saskatchewan River all the way south to the Yellowstone River, where you can see Butte and Bozeman and Billings, well, these, this was a southern boundary of the, United, uh, of the Blackfoot people. And then from the Rocky Mountains, and we, we say Mustuck Easts, but this was the backbone of the world to the Blackfoot people. So from the backbone of the world and then east to the Kapal Valley and Touchwood Hills, well, these were all places that were within um, our sacred stories as to where the Blackfoot people lived and where we roamed and wandered. So we know that these lands were part of our uh, traditional uh, territory, so to speak. So if we look at the next image, you also see another image of our um, of the Blackfoot territory, or what we considered home, our land. And so, I just like to point out that wherever the great northern herds roamed, a buffalo or bison, our people followed them. So basically, our territory was defined by the buffalo. So let's look at the next image then. So as we're going along, there's this word here, and it's itotasi mapi imiteiks or the day when we use dogs to move camp. But we shortened that term to the dog days. While the six gates eat the beaks, the Blackfoot speaking people, at first we were a people without horses. So we moved from place to place on foot and we used imita or the dog as our beast of burden. So as you can see in that image, we have this travois 
that they come up with this term, this French term for like a dog sled. This travel is in the back of the dogs and each person would have a dog probably leading them along and there would be a, a weight up to 80 pounds on the back of each of these dogs. And this is how we'd move our belongings from one place to another. So if we look at the next image, well, this is uh, about the Blackfoot people. We only traveled short distances at a time in the dog days. You probably, you're probably looking at three miles to five miles a day, and you're only as fast as the slowest member of your tribe. So, but as long as we could see the buffalo, as long as our ancestors were within sight of Emique Sea or the buffalo herds, then they were fine because then you know we're close to our, our, our staff of life. So if we look at the next image, we kind of see that. Now here's the Eni, our Emique Sea, the buffalo, our American bison as they call it. Well, this animal was the Blackfoot people's staff of life because it provided, our, provided the people with food and with clothing and with shelter. And it had hundreds of other uses. And so long as this animal was on the plains, the Blackfoot had no want. It provided everything for us. And in fact, it wasn't up until the time that this animal actually disappeared, was almost extirpated, big word meaning almost extinct. But it wasn't until this animal was almost extinct that our people kind of uh, started to suffer because now we didn't have our food or shelter or clothing and we had to become dependent on the rations and the things that the government gave out to us when the time when this animal actually disappeared off the plains. So the Blackfoot people were very dependent on this animal. Now in the winter, the Siksigaitikipiks moved to the foothills or along the banks of the sheltered rivers uh, that fell within our territory, such as the Bow River, the Red Deer River, the Belly River, the Old Man River, North Saskatchewan River, the Battle River, all of these different rivers and then some these all fell within our domains and these were all rivers that the Blackfoot people wintered on. So the thing is, we anticipated the buffalo coming back into these places, either into the river valleys or the foothills. So in the fall time, we would find winter camps and then we would set up these winter camps and then we would wait for the arrival of the buffalo. Because the buffalo, unlike other animals, it doesn't migrate south when it gets cold. When it gets cold, it goes into the river valleys. And this is where they ride out the storms and the blizzards and, and such during the winter. So this is kind of basically how things were for thousands, literally thousands and thousands of years. Our people lived in the dog days. This is what we did every day. We moved from place to place within sight of the, with the buffalo, but we were on foot. And as I mentioned, the, the dog was our beast of burden. Well, all of a sudden, Punukomita shows up. And this is the horse. And in Blackfoot, we had no word for this animal. So we called it the elk dog. And that's what Punukomita basically means, is elk dog. This animal was as big as an elk, but it, it could move things for us and it was as tame as a dog. And so they put these two words together, elk dog, Punukomita. And this is the name that the Blackfoot still call what uh, Europeans are not Bequins called the horse. So this animal, it changed uh, millennia old routine. Because like I mentioned, our people were living for thousands of years with the dog as our beast of burden. And then all of a sudden, like literally just like that, the horse appears. And the horse changed the lives of our Blackfoot people on an incredible scale. We could travel much farther. We can carry more goods. And it became a measure of wealth. And because of that, then there was, there was also a lot of horse raiding, a lot of warfare that took place once this animal was introduced to us. But it did change their life on, a, on an incredible scale. And this animal appeared to the Blackfoot people circa 19, or sorry, circa 1700. So it could have been a few years before 1700, a few years after. But it was literally around 1700, circa 1700, that the horse appeared to the Blackfoot people. Now these animals actually came from the Spanish invasion of Mexico from the 1500s. So this, is, this map that we're looking at kind of shows the dispersal of the horses. They came from the Mexico area and went northward. And over periods of time, they eventually kind of go, went to different uh, people. Now, if you look at that map there at the top of the mountains, this is the horse coming to the Blackfoot people up in that northern part there. And so, but the thing is, people have to understand that even though this was our land and our territory, and this is what we considered home, the Blackfoot people ranged the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, as far down as Santa Fe, Taos, New Mexico. 
Like we knew this land. And so it's very possible that our people first sighted these horses when we were on our travels on foot, going as far down, even past Colorado, up into uh, Santa Fe, up into the New Mexico, New Mexico area. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that there's a, a road or a trail they call the Old North Trail that kind of um, starts or ends in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and it branches off northward from there. But if you were to follow it southward, this Old North Trail uh, followed a uniform distance from the foothills or the Rocky Mountains, about 100 miles. And that's a present number two highway all the way down to uh, Helena um, in the States, all the way down to Santa Fe, uh, Taos, New Mexico. Well, the Blackfoot knew this trail very well. And then this is where the horses came up into the Blackfoot territory. So I just like to point that out. But once this horse came, it changed our lives, as I mentioned, on an incredible scale. But right after the horse, uh, we met the first Napikwin. So let's look at the next image here. Now, hard on the heels of the new horse culture came the Napikwins, our Europeans, for lack of better words. And they came with all these wondrous goods. Now, these goods included what you can see in the picture here. Some of these things were metal objects, such as knives, our axes, kettles that made daily life so much easier for our Blackfoot people. Uh, now we had uh, metal knives and arrowheads and cutting cloth was that much easier. And then we also had cloth products for, uh, for decoration, beads, and then tobacco, tobacco to replace uh, our own homegrown uh, tobacco. So these, when these goods came to us, they, they made life, as it mentioned, a whole lot easier. Now, the, uh, the thing is, we never met the Napikwins just yet. We, we met their goods. We met uh, the stuff that they were making. But if we move to the next image, we can see why. Now, from 1680 up until about 1786, there was a Cree Assiniboine middleman trade. So basically, these were those native tribes that were controlling the trade from the Hudson Bay and York factory. And the thing is, for almost uh, over 100 years, the Blackfoot people were trading with these native tribes, mostly Cree and mostly Assiniboine. And the thing is, these European goods first came through them, through the middlemen, to us. And they got them from the Hudson Bay or from the French, from coming from Montreal. And they brought them overland to the different prairie tribes, the Blackfoot being one of them. Well, you know, it's funny, more often than not, the prairie tribes, they end up paying three times for the cost of these goods. And most of the time, they were given to us secondhand by the middlemen in trade. So it was very rare that we got anything new. And at this time, too, they weren't selling alcohol or liquor. So the thing is, liquor was still unknown to our Blackfoot people. That's not to say there might be a few people um, who did make it up to the York factory back in the early 1700s, late 1600s, and they might have um, known what alcohol was, but it simply wouldn't have been transported thousands of miles from there to here and lasted. So the Blackfoot people in general as a whole did not know what alcohol was. We still didn't have any idea what this stuff was. But as I mentioned, for about 100 years, from 1680 to about 1786, when the first posts were put up in Blackfoot country, the Cree and the Assiniboine were the middlemen in trade. And the thing is, they uh, actually put a blockade and they kind of um, controlled the trade, even the amount of firearms or things that the Blackfoot would get. And by the 1700s, there was still a lot of warfare. It wasn't until about 1720 that their, the warfare between the tribes went down and then trade kind of took over. So this is what was happening before we actually met the Napikwans. So if we look at the next image, we see Manchester House. Hudson Bay Company Post, it was established in 1786. And here's a rendering of it, a drawing. Well, the first European traders to deal directly with the Blackfoot tribes were at this place, Manchester House, which opened on the North Saskatchewan River in 1786. So our people, you know, a lot of people don't understand this, but as far as I said, our territory went to the Kapal Valley and Touchwood Hills. Well, we were allied with the Grovens. Now, the Groven natives lived in that particular area, but together we were allied. So our people and their people could travel freely within our own territory. And the thing is, in Manchester House, if you look at this map, that's kind of like maybe the fourth house, I think, or third house in coming in from the east. Well, these are all the Hudson Bay Company posts and Northwest Company posts that were built after Manchester House all the way to Edmonton and finally to Rocky Mountain House. 
And it was those last two, Edmonton and Rocky Mountain House, that, the, that were nearest to the Blackfoot territory. And this is where the Blackfoot would bring their trade, usually to these two houses. But the thing is, our people are as far as Manchester House, up on the Battle River and the North Saskatchewan, the north side there. Well, this is where the Blackfoot were actually trading. And there's a place called uh, Buckingham House, uh, maybe just a little bit further up. Well, this is where the Blackfoot would go there every once in a while to trade. But once Manchester House was built, that was a regular source of uh, the point where the Blackfoot went to trade with the Europeans. So it was at this time that things changed a little. Uh, if we look at the next image, this is when the fur trade was going on. So when the first Napiquins began trading with us, the Siksikaitsita Beaks, on a regular basis in the late 1780s, their respective companies, these Napiquins, were already engaged in a bitter struggle for supremacy of the fur trade on the plains. Now, if we look at the next image, you can see these two companies. Well, the Hudson's Bay Company was established in England in 1670, and they were vying with the Montreal-based Northwest Company. And they were established around 1780, 17, uh, I'm not too sure exactly, I'll have to come back to the but I think about 1786 is when they actually first got together, the, the Northwest Company. So if we look at the next image, the fur trade. Well, it was to see, these companies were competing to see who would get the most beaver pelts and other small furs for fashion conscious Europe. And this is what the, the two companies were competing for. They wanted to get as many of these animals, pelts, as they could for, for fashion in Europe. Now, if we look at the next image, well, we can see that some, the importance of the beaver. By the year 1600, the need for more beaver fur exploded, hence uh, the competition on the Canadian uh, continent our Canadian country, the, the places where they trapped the furs actually. So the beaver pelts were desired by the Europeans for fashion, for their hats, like you can see there in the picture. Well, fur was valuable because it was waterproof. It was moldable and durable, and the best furs, like beaver, were very soft and very smooth. And also, these were a symbol of social superiority. So you can see why the beaver was important to fashion conscious Europe. But if we look at the next image, we could see that the Northwest Company, like a year later after Manchester House opened in 1787, and this is wrong actually, it's not the Northwest Company, it's the Hudson Bay Company that David Thompson was working for. And his, uh, when he spent the winter with the Pigani, it was after that winter that the Blackfoot and the Hudson Bay Company established friendly trading relations. And this was because of David Thompson. Uh, 1787, he came out and he basically lived with uh, Bikini for that winter. So if we look at the next image, you could see the Northwest Company trade routes. Now, as I mentioned, they were based from Montreal. So you could see that green line from Montreal all the way going east. And if you look at the bottom green line, that's basically where the French came in, the Northwest Company into the Blackfoot lands where you can see the North Saskatchewan, Rocky Mountain House, Kootenai Houses, which are actually on the other side of the mountains. Well, these were the routes that David Thompson explored for both the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company. So this Northwest route was the route of the Northwest Company when it came to trade with the Blackfoot. Now, if we look at the next image, you can see the Hudson Bay Company. So over the next few years, these traders, they moved farther and farther west and as I mentioned earlier, they opened Fort Edmonton in 1794, and then they opened Rocky Mountain House in 1799. And so these two companies got their trade with the Blackfoot through these two posts. And you can kind of see the Hudson Bay Company route. It's, it's just one blue line there, but that's basically the route that they took to get into Blackfoot country and uh, start their trade. So if we look at the next image, you can see Fort Edmonton here, established 1794. This is a rendering. There's actually been four different sites of uh, Fort Edmonton since that time up until today. And the, pres the last site was where the present legislative building is. And so that was uh, where Fort Edmonton uh, was located lastly. Uh, where this, it could have been either a little bit to the north, I mean, east or west of the present site. But Fort Edmonton, as I mentioned, was built four different times over that, over. 1794 till like now or until the end of the fur trade. So one of the other uh, posts that were very important, and this is where the Blackfoot came all the time because this was the closest 
to the Blackfoot Territory was Rocky Mountain House. And so the Hudson Bay Company established a post there in 1799, and it was this post that took in most of the Blackfoot trade. This is where the Siksigaitsi Tepiks felt most comfortable trading because it was closest to our territory. So if we look at the next image there, you can see those different Northwest Company forts and the Hudson Bay Company forts all up along the North Saskatchewan. Now, the, you know, the important thing about this is, is that those forts were far enough on the north side of the river that the Blackfoot did consider them on our territory, just outside of our territory. And in fact, though these people, the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company, they very rarely ventured onto Blackfoot land to seek out the tribes. It usually never happened. It happened a few times, but usually it never did happen from the beginning. So the thing is, it was always the Blackfoot going to those posts to trade and not vice versa. So the thing is, the Blackfoot were able to keep their independence and they weren't so much influenced by the traders as other tribes were east of us, like the Cree and the Assiniboine. Uh, if we look at the next image, well, our people benefited from the trade goods offered because it made life easier. You think about it. You don't have to make boiling pits. It was an all-day process. Now you have a kettle or you have a pot that you could uh, cook your victuals in. And uh, these trade goods offered um, all sorts like beads, just as we mentioned, all sorts of different stuff. And like I mentioned, because these forts were just be beyond our hunting grounds, these traders had little effect on our daily lives and customs. So this meant that we as a people, the 60 gates at the peaks, up until this time, we were still able to retain control over our lands and maintain our independence, just like we did before the Europeans showed up. Now, when we started to trade regularly with the Europeans at places like Manchester House and all the different forts that we saw going all the way to uh, Rocky Mountain House, well then, it was at this time that the Sixty Gates the Beaks, we acquired a regular supply of guns, ammo, and alcohol. Now, at this time, as I mentioned, up until 1786 in Manchester House, liquor was largely unknown to the Blackfoot people. We had no idea what it was or what it could do to you. In fact, we had no idea when people started to drink it and then they started to get drunk, they attributed that to supernatural uh, effects. Not so much like the, they didn't realize that they were getting drunk off this. They were thinking that their mind was being open to spiritual or supernatural things, uh, hallucinations, etc., etc. And so the Blackfoot, we really didn't know how to control this. We thought it was uh, something special when it wasn't, and it affected our lives on an incredible scale. Even to this day, it's still um, something that our people have a problem uh, dealing with, alcohol. Well, it's at this time in 1786, as I mentioned, the Six Gates the Peaks, we start to get regular supplies of these. Now we don't have to rely on the middlemen in trade for guns or for ammo. Now we can get it right from the post and we can go back as many times as you want to get more ammo and more guns or etc. And, and now alcohol. And the thing is, when they were trading with us, the traders, with the Blackfoot people, they didn't sell the alcohol to us right away. They gave it as gifts. But we'll find out more about that as we talk about this. But let's actually move on to the next uh, image. Now, the Hudson Bay Company trade started in 1670 and, until about 1770. So for, for about 100 years, for the first century when it had no competition, the Hudson Bay Company didn't deal with liquor. Not with the natives. There wasn't even a gift or it wasn't even part of trade. They, uh, the Hudson Bay Company imported just enough wine and brandy to look after their own needs, to look after the needs of their officers and their men. And so we know that this was regularly in 1770, but like a hundred years after they started trading out of the York factory, they were only importing 250 gallons of liquor. And this was for the entire HBC. So up until this time, 1770, the Hudson Bay Company didn't deal in alcohol when it traded with the native peoples in Canada. Or in, yeah, up in the Canadas. So we move on to the next image. The Northwest Company. Now the Northwest Company, these were Quebec traders, or what they call Norwesters. They were from Montreal. And these were descendants of the original French voyageurs and the Corrier de Bois who had been using liquor in their trade for generations. So these people were already dealing with the tribes down east and were using liquor to get entice them. And when they came out west, they did the same thing to the tribes. They enticed them with liquor and gave it out as gifts. And that's why the Northwest Company was so successful. If we look at the next image, 
Yeah, so when the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company both met on the on the prairie, on the plains, and they're both involved in this uh, fur trade competition, well, the Northwesters, or the Northwest Company, they dominate, dominated trade at first because of their excessive distribution of alcohol. They would give it out as gifts, as I mentioned. Um, not They didn't usually sell so much, but they gave out a lot as gifts to the native tribes that were coming in. They would give them alcohol before they actually did the trading. So, and and you have to understand, this was the Napiquins who were, who were introducing these procedures. Our people had no idea what these things were. All we know is we were getting luxuries like alcohol and tobacco and given it freely by a lot of the, um, the traders there. So if we look at the next image. Okay, so the Hudson Bay Company, they were convinced that if they were gonna survive and they were gonna be able to beat their competition, they'd have to bring in more liquor. So by 1785, it was bringing in more than 2,000 gallons, wow, 2,000 gallons of liquor to its depot at York Factory. Now remember, not even, um, 15 years earlier, they were bringing in 250 gallons of liquor. Now that's like almost twice the amount, 2,000 gallons a year in liquor. And that's just the stuff that's being imported. At York Factory, they had a still so they can make their own liquor. And so they would make their own liquor and then put that with the imported stuff. And this is what they would bring out to the tribes along the North Saskatchewan to give out as gifts to entice them uh, to trade with that company. So by this time, the uh, Hudson Bay Company was really increase, increasing the amount of liquor they were putting out. Now let's look at the next image. <clears throat> this is the Rupert's Land, this whole area here. And these are all the rivers that drain into the Hudson Bay. And this was an agreement, you know, uh, one of the kings there in England decided that this was uh, going to be a British territory. And this was all unbeknownst to the Blackfoot people or the other tribes that were living in this area. We had no idea that this... Uh, transaction took place. But this is the Hudson Bay and that's York Factory and that was where all the furs were being shipped to. And then they would take the ships and go to Europe. And then those sh same ships would bring liquor and trade goods to York Factory that would go out to the different tribes. So this was the Hudson Bay Company area, so to speak. So if we look at the next image. Well, high wines. Okay, so both the companies, they handled primarily rum and brandy, and they called these high wines. And these were brought in by canoe, like basically through the water routes. They took the big ships to come in, and then when they got to the continent, then they basically took uh, canoes, and they took canoes upriver to uh, different spots. So there was a lot of work involved in bringing, bringing all of these items in by the water routes, either from England or from Montreal. Well, all these high wines, they were carried in concentrated form in these large wooden kegs. So they would be shipping these large wooden kegs full of concentrated uh, rum or brandy over to the uh, to York factory, different posts. And when they got there, well, if we look at the next image, then you can see that at these posts, the spirits, they were diluted with water on the ratio for the Blackfoot of seven to one. So for one part of alcohol, they would mix in seven parts of water and that's what they would sell to the Blackfoot or give as gifts at first to the Blackfoot people when they came to trade. So when they came to trade, they either took away the liquor in a skin bag or in small kegs that were provided by the companies, the Northwest Company or the Hudson Bay Company. And this is at first how the Blackfoot got a taste of alcohol. See, you got to remember at this time, they're still not paying for it. The Blackfoot will not pay for, for liquor, for alcohol, because they look at it as water. They don't see it as anything different. And so when it was given as gifts, then they would freely partake in the gifts, but they would not buy it. So the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company realized that they had to do a lot more to be able to get them dependent and get them to trade. So if we look at the next image, Napioki. Now this is the Blackfoot word for alcohol. So as it says here, prior to contact with the Europeans, alcohol had been virtually unknown to the Blackfoot people. And not just us, but to most of the North American tribes. We had no idea what alcohol was. And there was no word in our language for intoxicants. So we come up with this word called Napioki, which translates probably to uh, best as white man's water. And because it, as I mentioned, because it was perceived to be a form of water, the Blackfoot at first wouldn't pay for it. So if we look at the next image, alcoholism. 
Now, this is a, this wasn't a problem with the Blackfoot people at this time, because when we, even when we first started trading with uh, not beak ones or the traders, alcoholism didn't really attach itself to our people, not just yet. But by the time that the trade was happening with the Blackfoot people, the different tribes all along the um, eastern seaboard, they were being dominated by it. Alcoholism was taking um, control of a lot of these natives already. And the thing is, the, the Napiquins or the traders, they knew this. They knew that the, the Blackfoot people or the native tribes had a fascination with, with this whiskey. And they knew that if they can get them coming back, they can get them dependent on it and hence alcoholism. But as it points out, the six Akati Tabiks were not immediately drawn to it. And we know this from trade records. So if we look at the next image, we look at Manchester House. Now this is trade in 1787. And so this Hudson Bay Company trader at Manchester House, he commented that the Pagans, quote, are now the quietest nation in the country, except for the Blood Indians. And I make no doubt will continue so Till the Canadians or the Northwest Company gets amongst them, which is the ruin of every nation by debauching their women and destroying themselves with poisonous rum. So even the Hudson Bay Company knew that the Northwest Company, uh, when they used liquor in the trade, that it wasn't good for the native peoples. And the reason they know this is because so many of those native peoples that were trading with the Northwest Company, a lot of them uh, were destroying themselves, as they put it, with poisonous rum. But that at that time, the Pikani weren't like these other tribes, that we were going in there, they considered us quiet, they considered us polite and such. So alcohol really didn't grab a hold of the Blackfoot people just yet. So if we look at the next image, in 1789, so this is a few years later, Edward Umberville, he stated that these people, the Sixigate the Beaks, are not so far enervated by the use of spiritist liquors as to be slaves to it when they come to trade. They drink moderately and buy themselves necessaries for war and domestic conveniences. So at this time, our Blackfoot people were still, when we met with the Napik ones, we were trading with them, trade goods, those uh, pots and pans and cloth and beads and stuff. And, and not just, uh, we weren't concentrating on liquor. Even at that time, liquor wasn't, uh, something that was big in the trade. So if we look at the next image though, gifts of alcohol. So as I mentioned that Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company, they knew that to gain and maintain the Blackfoot trade, they had to make the six gates eat the beaks dependent upon alcohol. And then they had to supply it in greater quantities than their competition. So both these companies were giving out incredible amounts of liquor as gifts to the native tribes. And the Six of Gates of the Beaks were also getting plied with this alcohol by both companies. So as a result of these spirits, this alcohol being given as gifts by both companies, their goal was achieved. They end up um, getting the Six of Gates of the Beaks dependent on this alcohol as well. So if we look at the next image. We kind of know this because there's one trader here at Fort George in 1794. Well, a Northwest Company trader at this post on the North Saskatchewan River, this is how he described just how successful they had been. He, he writes, quote, The love of rum is their first inducement to industry. He wrote, They undergo every hardship and fatigue to procure a skinful of the delicious beverage. He further described how alcohol had become an integral part of the trading process. So now it's a part of the process. It's not just a, a few gifts. Now that Whenever the native peoples come into trade, now there's a trading procedure that's been established. And this trading procedure uh, involved liquor. So once again, we can see those different houses up in the North Saskatchewan River. And this is where the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company uh, traded with the Blackfoot. It was along the North Saskatchewan River to the north of us. So if we look at the next image, so by 1811, while well, Alexander Henry, who was a trader with the Hudson Bay Company, well, by 1811, the trading procedure, as we mentioned, had become well established. In that year, the trader Alexander Henry commented, Spiritus liquor, quote, now seems to dominate them, the Pikani, and has taken such a hold upon them that they are no longer the quiet people they were. They appear fully as much addicted to liquor as the Crees. 
So, you know, that's funny because by 1770, and now you're looking at about 41 years later, now since the time that the Blackfoot first started uh, trading with uh, white people, actually that's 1786, so it's a little bit, about 30 years or so, but now the Blackfoot people are fully, uh, how would you say, the liquor is taking a hold of them. Now at this time you have to understand, the Blackfoot didn't come into these places every day to buy liquor. That wasn't the case. The tribes went in once or twice a year to trade with the traders. So if there weren't any liquor problems or binge drinking or anything, it only happened once or twice a year for the whole tribe. And then after they left these posts, they went back to regular life, hunting the buffalo and doing what they would, would do day after day for years for years with no liquor involved. So but let's look at the next image. Okay, well, this is the trading procedure. When they entered the house, they, the Blackfoot, are disarmed. They're treated with a few drams and a bit of tobacco. And after the pipe has been plied about for some time, they relax from their grouchiness or their whatever, taciturnity, in proportion to the amount of that they drank, basically. And then they start to all get loud. And then when their teepees are put up, then the traders gave all of these chiefs presents of rum so that the entire tribe could get drunk for 24 hours or longer. And then they would do this because they knew if they didn't do it, let's say the Hudson Bay Company was doing this, if they didn't want the Northwest Company to take their uh, trade away, they would continue giving these people as much drink as they wanted. And this is how they would do it. This became trading procedure. This wasn't the Blackfoot uh, determining how we should meet. This was all not Nopequins. This was the traders and this is their way of keeping the Blackfoot trade and getting people to come into their posts as opposed to the competition's posts by freely giving them more liquor and giving them um, uh, tobacco because tobacco and liquor were actually luxuries to the Blackfoot people at that time and even to this day. But if we look on to the next image, so part of that trading procedure was before the tribe actually showed up, there'd be two people who the traders would meet. And Henry, held, uh, Henry told how these two messengers would arrive at the trading post to announce that the rest of the tribe was on its way. And then these men were each given tobacco and a glass of liquor. And when the main body of natives arrived, the chiefs were invited into the fort where they went through a pipe smoking ritual like we saw in a previous picture and it was followed by a distribution of free liquor. So they were, as I mentioned, they were getting tobacco to smoke and they were getting liquor to drink. And the traders were doing this on purpose because they wanted to keep that trade and wanted to make the natives happy by giving them this liquor. So as you can see here, it became a routine, this pipe smoking ritual that was so important. To the native peoples, we smoked this pipe when we met people to, have a, to show the other person that we are good intentions in our meeting. But the Napiquins kind of used that pipe smoking ritual to uh, get our trade. And they would give us the free tobacco and the free liquor to, to keep us coming back. So Henry, he continues that after they gave that first round to the Indian chiefs, that person would be ceremonial in taking that drink and in smoking. And then he would drink the rest of it. And then after that, if we look at the next image, well, this is when the round went out to the tribe. And so after smoking and drinking for about half an hour in the fort, well, each chief was given a quart of liquor to take back to the camp. So others who wanted liquor, then they went to the fort too to trade tongue or trade bits of meat or what the, consider, what the traders considered trash. But they didn't want to make money off of this so much. They wanted to get the tribe drunk. So... When these people came in with this meat or whatever they were planning to trade, the traders just gave them liquor, just gave them a lot of liquor so that these people could drink all day, all night and into the morning. So if we look at the next uh, image, as I said, this became trading procedure. This was the routine. This is what they would do every time they came to the forts. They would get plied with liquor and tobacco, would get them gloriously drunk. And then when they were sober the next day, when uh, mostly everybody was still relatively sober, then began the serious trade. So at that time, they would continue, the native peoples or the Blackfoot, they would continue to buy some liquor. But for the most part, they would trade their furs, robes, dried meat and horses for true trade goods like metal objects, utensils, cloth, uh, European goods. And as I mentioned, this became the routine 
So from about 1786, right up until uh, the Hudson Bay Company fur trade ended, this was the routine. This is how the Blackfoot and how the traders would meet, how they would get together, and how they would end up trading. So let's look at the next image. Well, in 1821, there was a big event. This was uh, the liquor traffic. Well, first, the liquor traffic was still continuing in Blackfoot country, in the British territories along the Hudson Bay Company until 1821. Now, this is when the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company merged into the Hudson Bay Company. So now the competition, there was no competition. So within the entire Hudson Bay region, competition was eliminated. Now there was only one company, the Hudson Bay Company, and they're dealing with all the trade with the Blackfoot tribes. And the Northwest Company no longer existed because most of their workers joined the Hudson Bay Company. So this happened in 1821. Well, there was no competition for about a good 10 years. And then by the time 1831 came, well, the American Fur Company, the AFC trade began. Now in 1831, the Americans had established uh, Fort Union on the Missouri River. And this was in uh, the country of the Blackfoot people on the upper Missouri. So the AFC built Fort Union and they didn't hesitate to traffic in whiskey. In fact, a lot of these uh, American Fur Company traders were former Northwesters, were former uh, um, competitors with the Hudson Bay Company. And these people moved down to the Missouri River. So if you can see here, here's the American Fur Company trade route. Now, although whiskey was sold by the AFC, it, was, it wasn't its stock in trade. They were like the Hudson Bay Company. The AFC gave it as a gift to bring in their customers at first, and they sold it in limited quantities. But for the most part, they were using liquor, as the Hudson Bay Company did, was to entice the natives to come to their forts to trade. Now, if we look here, those are uh, these are American Fur Company posts, starting from the bottom where St. Louis is, and that's actually where the, the capital for the fur trade was in the United States of America, was in St. Louis, Missouri. And they would send steamboats up to say, uh, the Missouri, all the way up to like Fort Vermilion, Fort Lookout, Fort Pierre, as you can see on the map. And this is the Missouri. Then we get to Fort Berthold, Fort Beaufort. And then you see Fort Union there at the top. Well, this is where the Blackfoot first started trading with the American Fur Company in 1831. And then over the years, the American Fur Company moved farther upriver into Blackfoot territory, establishing Fort Mackenzie at first. And then when that was burnt down, finally establishing Fort Benton in 1847 or something like that, uh, 1850. And then this became this, the, the trade for, uh, with the Blackfoot. The Blackfoot would come to Fort Benton to trade off all of our robes and our uh, furs and such. But this was the American Fur Company trade route. And now after 1831, they're in competition with the Hudson Bay Company for the fur trade, the Blackfoot trade. And both of them are doing what they could to get as much of the Blackfoot trade as they possibly could. Now, if we look at the next image, you can see that this, uh, given uh, this new competition, the Hudson Bay Company felt it had no alternative but to continue to supply liquor. You know, that's funny because over this whole time, the British government banned selling liquor to native peoples. And the Americans basically did the same thing in 1834 with their intercourse law. They banned the selling of liquor to natives. You're not supposed to do it. It's illegal in the British country and it's illegal in the Americans. But yet both companies, Hudson Bay Company, the Northwest Company, and then the American Fur Company, all of them stated to a point that they wanted to get rid of the illegal liquor trafficking because it of a, gave them a bad name. But none of them did. None of them did. They did a lot of talking about stemming the flow of liquor into Indian country, but none of them did. Why? Because they made too much money. There was just too much money to be made. And at the same time, the people there really didn't care about the natives, whether they lived or died. And you can tell that by what they sold them. A lot of the liquor that was sold to the natives was poisonous in the first place. So it was all about profit. So although these uh, alcohol was used primarily as gifts to cement trade relations, rum and brandy were still an integral part of the British Blackfoot trade until their use was discontinued in 1862. And it was in that year that the last drop of rum at Edmonton House was served out to the natives in December. So they sold liquor right up until 1862. 
Now, Fort Benton on the Missouri, as I mentioned, this was an American fur company trading post, and it became Fort Benton in 1850. Well, you know, a lot of informants from the Hudson Bay Company, the Northwest Company, American Fur Company, they agreed it was mostly older people who bought liquor from either the American or the British forts. And as around the British forts, the use of liquor resulted in tragedies around American forts. Because this periodic drinking in the Blackfoot camps also resulted in violence and bloodshed. Now the thing is, we don't talk about it too much, but during all this period when the alcohol was first introduced to the Blackfoot people, Things like this happened. There was tragedies, there was violence, but it very rarely did it happen. And as I mentioned, the Blackfoot are only visiting these posts once or twice a year. Um, well, let's look at this. You know, the disastrous effects of the liquor on the Blackfoot while they were at these trading posts and immediately upon their return to the camps cannot be questioned. There's trade journals, there's records of it, of the violence that happened. And the only reason why it wasn't more serious, as I mentioned, was because the Blackfoot usually only came to these posts once or twice a year. And they also had to endure a long journey through dangerous um, enemy tribes territory to get to these different posts. So they had to be on their guard. They had to be very vigilant. So it wasn't until they got to these posts that maybe they would have a two or three day bender. And then after that bender, it was back to normal. They would leave the posts, Liquor would no longer be an issue or a problem, and they would go back to their hunting grounds and do what they always did, hunting the buffalo. And then when they accumulated enough furs, then they would come back to the trading post to trade those furs in for uh, trade goods and for alcohol. Now this became like the, the norm, as I mentioned. And at this time, alcohol was a problem, but it wasn't a big problem. Because as I mentioned, you have to understand, only going to those posts twice a year would limit the amount of bad things that were happening. But most definitely, when these tribes showed up at the trading post and started their drinking, there was a lot of bad things that happened, fights. Um, interestingly enough, in the winter counts, when you look at the winter count records, before 1831, there are very few, if any, accounts of violence or things that happened because of alcohol. It's not until after 1831 that you start to see in the winter counts how alcohol started to affect our people, where there was murders. By 1840, um, one of the first accounts was a woman was murdered by a drunk Indian. It could have been a, um, a drunk blood. It could have been her husband or it could have been a, maybe a brother. The winter count record didn't say, but it most definitely said that this woman was put to death by a person who was drunk. And then if you look at the record a few years later, a man who wasn't usually given to drink was put to death by his two sons because he went crazy. He went throughout the camp and started shooting at people and started trying to pick fights, went to the chief, tried to kill the chief. And he just had a little bit of alcohol, but it was as if he had a lot. And what ended up happening was he ended up getting put to death, as I mentioned, by his sons because he ended up uh, doing some really dangerous and crazy things. But as I mentioned, during this time, the alcohol really didn't take an effect, it didn't really affect the entire nation because it was, it was still rare for us to, to get this stuff, even though they did give it out freely. Now, if we look at this next image, well, as I kind of mentioned, from 1670 to 1831, from the beginning, the liquor trade was a profitable business. Like these people were making a killing. They were making a lot of money. You have to understand the trade. It's sort of almost like having a 35 cent cup of watered down fire water is equal to one buffalo robe that that person can sell for $16 in St. Louis. This is how the whiskey trade was. Even from the beginning, they gave away this and then the native peoples would buy up their goods um, and they would make a lot of money off of the furs. They, they made huge profits. So major companies like the Hudson Bay Company and the American Fur Company, they dominated the trade because they had the resources to do so. So like in far off London and Washington, even though the politicians in both these places were protesting the traffic amongst the native peoples, nothing was done. Because so long as there were profits to be made, whiskey trading would continue to survive continue to survive. So we're kind of stopping here at 1831. 
And then next week, we're going to go on to the next part of uh, the series. And that's going to involve uh, from 1831, right up until around the time of 1870, before the whoop-up trade. And then we can, then and that, at that time, we'll be able to see just how bad the liquor problem became for the Blackfoot peoples. Like right now, up until this time in history, 1831, alcohol has um, been a problem for some of the Blackfoot people, but as a whole for our nation, it was largely unknown. It was mostly old, only the older people who were partaking of it. Even the young people wouldn't partake of it because it interfered with what they needed to do, feeding their families, hunting the buffalo, etc. things like this. But after 1831, alcohol becomes a big issue. And we'll find, about, find out more about that in those in that next program to come. But this is where we're going to be pretty much stopping this week. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of you are starting to realize that when the alcohol first came into the Blackfoot people, we had no idea what it was at first, and then we became addicted to it in a sense. And some of us had problems not handling it. But for the most part, up until 1831, alcohol didn't really grab a hold of our nation. It wasn't until the coming years that that happened. And as I mentioned, we'll find out more about that in a future program. But in, uh, let's, let's take a look at the next image. I think this is, um, this is the, okay. I just want to point out for some of you people who are following along here, if you want to find out more about uh, the trade, the Hudson Bay Company trade, the Northwest Company trade, the American Fur Company trade, and the Blackfoot these are some books that you could take a look at. Like this one is Indians in the Fur Trade. This is actually a very good book, has a lot of good dates, has a lot of um, information regarding the fur trade. And this is by Arthur J. Ray. And if any of you can look online, I imagine you can find this book, but this is a good book to uh, um, read into when you want to find out about the actual trade between the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company. And of course, this is an awesome book by acclaimed uh, historian, Hugh, Hugh Dempsey. Now this book, Firewater, talks about basically what we're talking about now, just kind of like when it was introduced. And in fact, this book has a lot more cases. If you were to take a look at it, you can see how bad things got as opposed to when the alcohol first came and how steadily, gradually it got worse amongst the Blackfoot people. And it kind of stops up around the time of the whoop-up trade. Now this is a good reading. If you want to find out more about the American Fur Company and that trade with the Blackfoot people, this is a good book to read. Now this is Jerry Potts, Bear Child, the book's entitled in Blackfoot, that's Gyaokosi, uh, Gyaokosi, Jerry Potts. And so this is actually a really good book when it comes to dates and times when different events happened and even how bad the liquor, the, the, the whoop up trade got. Just incredible how it affected our people on an incredible scale and just brought so much trauma and tragedy to us. And it's a shame that with the residential school period, not teaching our people about these histories while they were doomed to repeat themselves. And that's what happened to the Blackfoot people. We never learned for the first time from all of these problems that were affecting our people from the past. And because of that residential school, not teaching our people, we never learned from our past. So that's why in the 60s scoop, and even to this day, we still have alcohol problems. We have people who don't know how to handle that liquor, don't know how to drink and all sorts of violence and things come because of it. Well. This uh, series we're looking at right now, we're going to go more into this um, in the weeks to come. But as I mentioned, for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about the whiskey trade and learn a little bit more about trade in general with the Napik ones from the first time that we started uh, trading with them, take a look at some of those books that I mentioned. And uh, in the meantime, I guess I'll see you here next week. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, gain and be safe. COVID's still out there.